from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. She is joined by Dr. Michael J. Burson, a professor of social science education at the University of South Florida and a senior fellow in the Florida Joint Center for Citizenship. He instructs courses in technology in the social studies, elementary social studies, visual research methods in education, and teaching the Holocaust. Michael has extensively published and presented his research worldwide. His research on child advocacy and technology in social studies education has achieved global recognition. They'll be joined by Barb Kerber, Kirby, who has worked in higher education administration for over 20 years. She was named director of the Waynesburg University Teaching with Primary Sources program in 2004 and the TPS Eastern Region in 2007. Combined, these programs have reached thousands of teachers both directly and through the network of 110 regional projects. And Sue Wise, also of the Teaching with Primary Sources program at Waynesburg University, is the assistant director there since August of 2005. She was promoted to associate director in 2007. Prior to joining TPS, she taught kindergarten. Sue also teaches all undergraduate social studies methods courses for Waynesburg University. So I am going to mute myself and drop out and turn this over to the presenters you've all come to hear. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, greetings from Waynesburg, and welcome to the Young Learners Explore Library of Congress Images. This is Barbara Kirby. And as uh, Cheryl was kind enough to introduce me, I'm the um, coordinator of the TPS Eastern Region and director of the TPS program at Waynesburg. And again, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, Sue Wise. And today, we're going to share with you the work of our regional partners who are on the leading edge of using primary sources with very young learners. Uh, we thank you for joining us. We could go ahead just a, a, another two slides. OK. Um, to get started, please use the chat feature to let us know who's on the line. We're very interested in knowing where you're from and what age children that you teach. <clears throat> I see K through 2 in Virginia from Margaret. K through 5 in Lafayette, Louisiana. We have an administrator on the line. Thanks for joining us. 7 through 12 in Worcestershire. Um, kindergarten in Jefferson, PA, which is right down the road here. Thanks. Please keep these um, comments coming throughout the session and include your questions, too. Early childhood education is defined differently depending on where you live. Here in Pennsylvania, early childhood ranges from birth to grade four. In the project Sue's going to present in just a few minutes it, from Cabell County Schools in West Virginia, early childhood is defined as birth to kindergarten. And in Florida, where our early childhood experts, doctors Eileen and Michael Burson teach, early childhood is birth to third grade which happens to align with the national and international definitions of early childhood. What does early childhood mean to you? I see birth to five. We'll get a, a range here, I'm sure. Our objectives for this session are all focused on early childhood and primary grade students. Um, for this session, we will examine the selection of developmentally appropriate primary sources, explore evidence-based strategies to support students' critical inquiry with images, and reflect on actual classroom-based examples demonstrating impl implementation. Uh, 
I am pleased to inter or I turn the mic over now to um, Eileen and Michael Burson. Uh, we've been working with them for um, a couple of years now and um, always learn something new from um, Dr. Eileen and Michael um, Burson. So I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barb, and it's our pleasure to join you here this evening. Um, one of the things that we want to kind of give a bit more context here to this idea of working with young children in the use of primary sources. When we're really looking at young children, we recognize that young children already have great familiarity with gaining meaning about the real world through pictures. In fact, even toddlers have been shown that they can transfer novel information taken from realistic images and apply that to their emerging world knowledge. So one of the things we've been exploring in our own research is how historical images can provide a conduit for young children to use their real world experiences and prior knowledge, and then learn how to make inferences about time and place and expand their understanding of key concepts. So we are working with teachers on how they can build upon this pictorial competence that young children already have as it gradually develops over time throughout the early years. But the issue that we need to face is that teachers need to intentionally expand upon young children's access to informational text. And this, unfortunately, tends to be marginalized in most early learning environments. In fact, research shows that in the typical first grade classroom, children spend less than three minutes a day with informational texts. So our first point of access is how we can bring into the classroom these valuable resources. We know that within our early childhood classrooms that there already is a privileged position of text-based literacies. Literacy forms the core of most early childhood curriculum. And although text does occupy this privileged position in classrooms, we do, as we've already said, see that visual representations of knowledge are a key role for early years. And so we're looking at how we can draw on developmentally appropriate accommodations to bring in visual images as part of communication. In fact, teachers already do this inherently and naturally as part of their practices. We oftentimes will scaffold children's learning experiences or encourage them to engage in multimodal expressions with pictures or accompanying their written words and verbal responses with drawings. Unfortunately, though, many of us are, have to negotiate our way with curriculum that often situates these images as incidental. And we don't fully appreciate necessarily the intellectual sophistication that these images provide that does even rival text-based literacies for young learners. So here in, in this uh, image here, we have depicted um, a reading lesson taking place, a very familiar sort of iconic representation. And we know, although we've already said, the inherent value that primary sources can have as an instructional resource, most early childhood and early elementary teachers have not had formal preparation or professional development that guides them in how to bring these resources into their classrooms and work with young learners in ways that would be able to access and engage their funds of knowledge. Moreover, because we've had such limited research up to this point in time on the integration of primary sources in the early grades, a lot of the research that people have had to rely on have really been situated more for how to use this instruction with students in intermediate grades and higher. And we cannot just take those processes meant for older learners and extrapolate them downward. Um, young children have their own unique ways of knowing and wisdom about the world, and so we want to be able co to connect into those valuable ways that they think about. Even though we have these challenges, 
We also do have an opportunity and an entry point because most states throughout the United States have standards that require the introduction and use of primary sources beginning as early as kindergarten. And so that's our entry point for us to be able to look for ways that we can bring them into our classes. So what do we mean by developmentally appropriate practice? Well, what we're talking about there is the ways that we can connect specifically with young learners' ways of making sense and meaning of the world. We recognize, as this young child is um, showing us here, that curiosity ignites discovery. When we unveil a sort of an, and begin asking brilliant, amazing sort of questions of interest about things that we see in front of us, that init initiates our process of discovery and inquiry that young learners actually have an inherent skill with. In fact, they're very uh, skilled at asking us the most embarrassing questions at the least opportune time. But we also recognize that this process of seeing of what's in front of you comes well before even the words and the vocabulary have developed. Children look and they recognize before they even have the capability of speech. And so because this visual literacy precedes verbal fluency, this is a very important foundation for early reading and writing skills. But in order for those visual images to maximize student learning and achievement, teachers need to include techniques for teaching children visually. So this involves an intentional exploration of images as part of this pedagogy in schools that we move students from what we refer to as sort of an arbitrary seeing, where there's not a lot of sense making or exploration or deep consideration about what's there to moving them more to a deliberate looking. And that deliberate looking begins to problematize images as we construct meaning of information that's depicted in that visual data in front of us. So we're going to share with you a lessons learned from actual implementation that's been done in classrooms from preschool up through grade three. And, and these are the field-based lessons that we have learned from our teachers and children with whom we've worked um, that have informed our body of research. So one of the things that we recognize is that teachers initially um, face challenges when they are searching for uh, developmentally appropriate resources to introduce to young students. So one of the things that happens is that in order for a primary source to be meaningful, we recognize that our young learners need to be able to engage with it personally. So there has to be something about it that has some familiarity. And it's on that personal connection, that relevance and familiarity, on which they can find initial pleasure and looking at it, feel interest in what they're looking at, and then also begin exploring alternative or deeper meanings that can expand their intellectual engagement and really foster their exploration of concepts. So given that, not all images are well suited for young children. The other thing is that teachers um, also have some challenges with are navigating the archives themselves to locate developmentally appropriate and relevant images. And that can be frustrating sometimes because the archives themselves can prove to be a bit cumbersome if you don't know the exact words to put in or not necessarily even using words that fit within a historical context. So for example, a teacher may put in the words grocery store, but in the historical context or the region that they want to find a resource, maybe a better term would have been market. Or they may be looking for representations because children are interested in exploring transportation. And so they put in the words gas station. But historically, the term of reference to be able to find appropriate images may have been filling station. Same thing with using terms like hair salon versus a beauty shop. And so you can get a broader range sometimes if you situate it more closer to the historical context and the verbiage that was used then. And that's, that's a challenge for teachers to be able to negotiate through that. But starting off with topics 
from a developmentally appropriate perspective of issues that have connections with children in a locally familiar way. Now, as our introduction um, noted, Michael and I are both at the University of South Florida, which is in Tampa. And um, for our students, uh, a locally familiar place is represented in this next image. And so for some of our students, as they walk to school each day, they actually see dolphins swimming in the bay. And they're out about, or just around that time, the children would be walking along the sidewalk on the path of the bay. And so this is a familiar context of an image for them to be able to see. But when we introduce this particular uh, image in a group of kindergartners, the one thing that they asked, their first question of inquiry was, why are the children um, encaged and the dolphin gets to be free. So they read this image as it was the dolphin who came to visit the children who were in sort of like a zoo-like engagement. And it was the dolphin who get to have the free fun of exploring in his ocean setting throughout the day, because that was the context in which they engaged and interacted with children. So Eileen has given us some wonderful background on the research and the practice associated with primary sources. <clears throat> Is the primary source image attractive, large, and clear? Does the image entice the interest of the young learner? We're going to have some fun with some primary sources right now to give you a context of what is a developmentally appropriate primary source. So let's take a look at this image from 1940. Publix is a supermarket chain in Florida. And Eileen had used the term earlier, problematize. So when you look at this picture, what are some problems that you might see? What are some things that you might see that look familiar? Anybody know where they store the ice cream? Does anybody see all of those freezer cases? Why aren't they there? What types of fruits and vegetables might you have? So when you look at an image like this from long ago, and you talk to children about something that's a part of their lives, a part of their regular everyday experience, you can ask difficult questions and get them thinking through the use of primary sources. Our keynote speaker, Carol Highsmith, has done a wonderful job of focusing on communities. And one of the most amazing aspects of using primary sources with young children is to get them involved in their own personal community. Here we have a young woman, a little girl, taking a picture um, in her neighborhood in Naples, Florida. And what we do is we send children out into their communities, much like Carol Highsmith did, and taking images uh, of their own to incorporate primary sources into their own experiences and instruction. Context and understanding is extremely important. As Eileen mentioned, as we work with teachers, one of the most interesting and difficult aspects is making meaning of the image themselves. The context of the sense of place, time, and the purpose of the primary source becomes extremely important. The making meaning, though, is challenging because some of our teachers lack the content knowledge related to the images that they might be exploring with their, with their young learners. In this particular case, we're going to be showing you an image of a what's called a white wing. And when you look at this individual and you simply look at the caption, you might not get enough information. So teachers, again, and their students might struggle to make meaning of what's incorporated into this image. So how do we go about doing that? We have to ask questions. For example, who are the helpers in our neighborhood? Who are the helpers long ago? Let's do some research. So when we look at this picture, let's play a game of hide and seek for a second. Can anyone see the pig in the picture? Where's the pig located? So you can see the pig on the left-hand side in the corner. And you might ask yourself, why is something like that important, especially when you just showed us a picture of a man sweeping the street? Well, pigs were used in New York City to clean up trash. But the pigs themselves often made more of a mess than they were cleaning up. So as a researcher with your young children in class, you can explore th these discussions about what was New, New York City like? Who were these white wings? And what was their job? 
These individuals would play, play an important role in the health and well-being of New York City. And it's interesting, they were called white wings. You know, when you think of the image of white and nice and clean, they were there to clean up the city. Now, one of the interesting elements associated with, um, with cleaning up the city is going beyond that, taking a look at how pigs were used, what, what life was like in New York City, and there are a number of images incorporated into the primary source collection at the Library of Congress that you can explore in greater detail, or you could even watch films related to the White Wings on Parade. And this creates a great um, frame of reference for our young learners when they actually get to see the White Wings in action. But when you look at these large pictures and you help your students contain, contain themselves as they look at all of these different images and they try to explore all of the different representations in an image, where do they focus? How do you help them focus? One of the great ways that is available is something called the crop it. The crop it technique is something that you may or may not be familiar with where you take two pieces of paper, you can do it either digitally or by hand, and you can zoom into a particular element in a photo. When a child explores a large image with a lot of different representations and a lot that's going on, they sometimes find it difficult to focus themselves. So having and using a tool like crop it helps them in a great, great way by focusing in on a particular element of the photograph. So let's take an example of this photograph and we're going to show you the crop it technique. When you look or you introduce this to a young learner, and it's uh, the Palace Market in Lincolnville in St. Augustine, Florida, 1922 to 1927, there's a lot going on. There are people there, there's a bicycle there, there's a young boy there, there's food. What would you have your students focus on first? Where would you attract, as a teacher, as an administrator, someone working with primary sources, what would you focus in on? So let us show you what we think is an area that would be a great place to start when you're focusing in on, on this image. Good. The boy. Excellent. Julie said the boy. Exactly. And here's an example of what we would mean by using the crop it technique. So we've, we've um, highlighted the area out in the back, but we boxed in the young boy with the bicycle. And there are a lot of questions. Let's go back to the term Eileen used before, because we're taking children beyond just seeing and saying, OK, I see a boy with a bicycle, to thinking about inquiry, inquiry, developing thoughtful explanations to what's going on, and asking difficult or problematic or problematizing questions. What's he doing with the bicycle? Why is he in the store with a bicycle? Who is he? What do you think he's going to do? And getting young children to start here at this particular point and then expand out. Anybody want to guess what they think he is doing in this picture? Excellent, Jamie. Delivery boy, exactly. And that's why he has his bike filled up with groceries or other materials. Excellent, very good. Another area that we want to focus on is the, what's called the contextual knowledge. And this is extremely important when you're working with primary sources. Okay, we find amazing images at the Library Congress or in our national or in our archives. And what do you do with them? What's the background knowledge that's necessary? In this particular case, we were studying scales. But beyond just bringing in the primary sources, the images of the scale, and there's a great image of a baby being weighed on a scale. They may have seen their brother or sister in the doctor's office being weighed. There are some larger scales or scales that they are so old they may not be familiar with them. But what we would like to do then is to build a contextual knowledge base, a background, by bringing in some other artifacts to build their content knowledge, to get them thinking or seeing different representations of information. So the other thing is that we recognize is that we can utilize these primary sources to help foster young children's critical thinking skills. So I want you all to think about, I think our question got a little cut off here, but the question is, 
what can you catch with a fishing pole? So if you sit there and you kind of think about in your mind, what are possible things that I might catch with a fishing pole? And if you're a five-year-old imagining the idea, again, if that's part of your frame of reference of having places that you can go fish, and thanks, Mike, yes, obviously, we can catch fish with a fishing pole. What, how about this? We can use a fishing pole to catch a brand new toy. So here we have an image that helps students begin to think about that sometimes we can be surprised by taking what's familiar and part of our lived experience and now rethinking about it in a different way and exploring about other ways that tools, resources may have been used by others as part of their lives. So we can think about also taking another context that has some familiar elements, but also has some different things because of its historical situation. So let's look at this one. And we might say to children, so what clues in this picture help tell us about where the event is taking place? So we had noticed that there's a stove and pots and pans, and Mike also noted about all the pots. And so as children, as part of that visual literacy, what they begin connecting with is finding representative data points to justify and substantiate the conclusions that they're drawing. Think about how powerful that is for very young learners to be able to bring out and read the information they're seeing as opposed to just looking at it. Oh, you know, somebody is in a kitchen. Then we could go into harder questions about what's happening or what's going on in there. Uh, what is she doing in the context of there? And actually, in this particular picture, she's making an apple pie. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic for children to be able to and teachers to be able to support students' critical thinking by introducing these kinds of perspectives and orientations. Now, one of the things we also recognize is that young children typically assess the things that they see visually as sort of the truth and representations of credible information. And so we need to continue to foster, again, those inherent sort of questions that they begin asking and instruct them about evaluating and challenging the information sources. So one of those representations of the way that we might do that in our context, again, from Florida, is introducing this core sort of image. So if we were to introduce this in a classroom within the context of our early childhood setting, maybe in the chat I'd like to hear some of you about some of the prompts that you might ask young students about this particular image. So how might you focus the lens of your young students to help them read the text of this particular picture? What is Santa doing, lounging out on the beach when he should be delivering toys to us? <laughs> so how is this young boy seem to be feeling upon something upon Santa wearing shorts instead of pants <laughs> or whatever he might be doing? Wondering, where is this place? And so these are all very important about fostering students' sense of critical literacy questions. And thinking about also, what kind of skills would you need to scaffold and help children to accomplish their thinking and engaging in this higher level kind of inquiry? So as you all consider to think about and contemplate what Santa is doing on the beach um, on this particular day and how this young boy may be reacting to stumbling upon Santa lounging instead of working away in his shop, we're going to go ahead and transition over to Sue. Sue. Thanks, Eileen and Michael. Now we'd like to share with you another powerful example of using primary sources with young children. 
Lenora Richardson is the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for Cabell County Schools in West Virginia, and she initiated and directed this TPS project. Lenora could not be online with us today, so I'd like to share with you some of the wonderful classroom applications of Library of Congress primary sources in Cabell County Schools. Two unique aspects of the past and present project were that there was a, a huge collaboration between the primary source teachers, or excuse me, the pre-service teachers at Marshall University and the in-service teachers across the district. They worked on this project throughout. And the focus also on the local history and culture. Kindergarten through fifth grade students in rural and small urban schools learned about the history and traditions of their own hometowns and about the wider Appalachian culture as they explored their past and present through multiple lenses. First graders looked at the, through the lens of homes. As we were reminded yesterday during Carol Highsmith's keynote presentation, if you were lucky, to, lucky enough to uh, sit in on that, it was a fantastic presentation. But she said, the essence of the people and the culture of local communities across this country can be conveyed and understood through photographs. First graders developed visual analysis skills as well as their reading and math and fine motor skills in their study of local homes. Local photographs paired with digitized images were analyzed for historic and architectural detail and later compared and contrasted with modern built homes. Next, students worked to create scaled diagrams of their own houses and they worked with family members to measure and draw important features. As a final project, students created model homes of their very own design. Discussion throughout the unit helps students think deeply about the change over time and local cultural and cultural practices and changes. Working with parents and grandparents and discussing the project helped families make connections with historical items and family heirlooms in brand new ways. Third graders at Cabell County focused on the local school culture as they compared historic images with modern day observations. They discussed daily activities and compared classroom technologies. They interviewed their family members and considered how the school experiences of their elders differed from their own experiences and why these differences existed. One Cabell County School, Martha Elementary, is featured here. The image on the lower right shows the old schoolhouse before it was destroyed by flooding. The modern school, shown above, was built close to the original location, but in a less flood-prone area. Martha Elementary stands testament to the local community's resilience. Geography paired with environmental factors, population changes, and economic conditions all played key roles in this study of the local school system. In the end, students even got to make recommendations that they thought would help improve their own schools, promoting civic competence and action. Cabell County Schools saw the need to move beyond the traditional textbook-driven curriculum and to move away from passive, unengaging student learning environments by incorporating primary sources as an integral part of classroom instruction. This TPS initiative provided ongoing and embedded professional development for Cabell County teachers focused on locating and carefully selecting primary sources from LOC.gov and other local sources uh, to promote inquiry learning. As Michael and Eileen mentioned earlier, the careful selection of primary sources for use with, pri with young children is, is of utmost importance. Ms. Richardson's report on the results of this project included these highlights. The strategies and resources provided by the TPS program have been instrumental in shifting instruction from teacher-directed to more student-directed learning. And we hear that all the time, how important that is. 
Young students and struggling readers have shown increased ability to gather information by utilizing visual primary sources, making observations that contributed to collaborative discussions. So students who were not able to read um, well could contribute much better in this environment using the visual primary sources. Cabell County School District continues to provide annual professional development events based on these positive results, and this case study continues to inform teacher preparation at Marshall University. While the projects presented here were managed through the TPS Eastern Region Program, the Library of Congress has a wealth of resources freely accessible for pre-K to two teachers directly. The Teaching with the Library of Congress blog is the go-to place for discovering and discussing the most effective techniques for using primary sources in your classroom. Projects presented today from the University of South Florida and Cabell County Schools demonstrate definitively that kin even kindergartners can observe, reflect, and ask good topic-related questions and provide targeted reasons for their thinking, allowing children to get hands-on with primary sources and providing question starters are developmentally appropriate ways to make deeper thinking and learning more accessible for young learners. The first example here on the screen, Kindergarten Historians, features video footage of yet another group of kindergartners in action, this time from New York City. So um, if you have a moment, please check that out. Educational staff at the library have developed three sets of primary sources with the specific needs of K through 2 classrooms in mind. Symbols of the United States, Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln, the three great presidents, and children's lives at the turn of the 20th century were all designed for this age group. Each of these is easy to download and print as a PDF document and each includes age-appropriate primary sources, historical background information, teaching ideas for the early childhood classroom, and analysis tools. The Children's Lives set features the ways that children worked, played, and learned at the turn of the century. And this is one of several primary source sets that's also available as an e-book. Youngsters can use iPad tools to manipulate and electronically mark up individual sources to help communicate their ideas. The library also has several ready-to-go learning activities to help foster observation, reflection, and questioning skills in, their youngest in our youngest students and use these skills across the curriculum. Each one is aligned to state standards, and you can select whatever state you are in and find the primary source um, activities that relate to your own state standards. Engaging multiple senses, as you know, can be beneficial for young learners. Listen and wonder, is it a chicken or a boy? Can be effective for engaging students across the learning spectrum and lots of fun too. These are just a few of the highlights of the resources featured on the Teaching with the Library of Congress blog. We encourage you to subscribe to the blog and get new entries and resources delivered straight to your inbox or your RSS feed. We'd like to open it up now to some questions. So what questions do you have? Yes, great. Um, Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And I have a few questions. But feel free to add any more as we go along right now. We have a few minutes for question and answer. Um, one of the questions that came through is one for either of either Eileen or Michael Burson. And that is, could you say more about having students focus on one particular detail in a primary source. Um, what's the advantage of having them focus on a detail, whether in crop it or whatever, that you choose? And when would you want them to choose a detail of interest on their own? 
It's a wonderful question. Um, thank you, whomever asked that. So part of the process of working with primary sources with very young learners is to scaffold their skill set and be able to help them over time develop enhanced and increased visual competencies and in working with this sort of sense making that is an inherent skill that they have is seeing what they have, but really looking intently, as we said, this very intentional movement from just seeing to looking. That idea of focusing on a small subset of an image is really that initial scaffolding step, is that we don't want them just to kind of go all over the place. And, and quite honestly, there can be a lot of distracting elements that are in a visual image that may take away from either the core concept that you're trying to teach or emphasize as part of your instruction, or just may create too much information, so almost an information overload for the young learner to be able to optimize their meeting and active engagement with that particular element. The other thing is that it's sort of like um, the interest and fun. You know, when we're working with young learners, we always want to be very playful in our approach. And so this sort of gradual unveiling of the various little pieces of the puzzle also adds interest and also helps facilitate their active engagement in that process of learning. Right. We've also explored the use of some single concept images. And, and really, we've been talking a lot today about the formal use of primary sources. So using crop it techniques, you know, selecting images, focusing in students' attention. But there are single concept images at the Library of Congress. For example, we found a few children washing their hands. And those can be informally placed in the classroom where children can specifically look at a particular concept, washing your hands, which is something that's done in most classrooms across the country. So focusing in on a particular topic through a crop it technique or selecting an image that focuses on a particular concept. And the question about at what point do you kind of move or shift to students being able to direct or engage in that. And that's always about sort of the readiness and the skill set of the students. We are, are very strong proponents of a child-centric curriculum, um, sort of following the lead of children with their areas of interest and inquiry sort of being the guiding framework. It, it's a wonderful way to mobilize and foster their interest um, in looking and exploring and information. And one of the things that we also should mention um, you know, for anyone who's worked with very young children, although there has this been, there's been this preponderance of representation of fictional resources in early learning classrooms, um, actually research bears out that young children have a much greater preference for authentic representations of the world around them. It's the things that they connect with better. So although adults version of the way children think that they should see the world is cartoon-like. Children actually prefer looking at real representations of other people, places, um, and the lives and experiences of those around them. Thank you very much, both of you. Let's skip around a little bit. Um, um, perhaps Sue Wise could address this question from Bonnie Welch, with young children, is one photograph enough, or is it better to have multiple photos so the children can pair and look more closely? Thank you. That's a great question. And when you're starting to use primary sources in the classroom, sometimes the, the inclination is to use a, a wide variety of, of primary sources. But I have found in my experience to start with one source as kind of a, a, a launching point for a topic. Um, as Eileen and Michael mentioned, narrowing down that information that they are taking in to, um, to focus on the details that are important, building that context, and then bringing in additional primary sources to build on that prior knowledge over time. Um, I, I saw earlier someone mentioned a gallery walk, setting up a series of um, images that are focused on a particular topic. 
uh, can help students build um, their, their ideas about uh, perspective and understanding um, of multiple um, views on a topic as well. But starting small and building from there would be um, what I would advise based on my experience. And, and I invite Eileen and Michael um, to uh, add to that. Um, thank you very much. And in fact, I just am interrupting to say that um, Bonnie Welch has just added a little detail. She's wondering as well about whether multiple copies of the same photo. I guess she perhaps she's thinking about grouping or how do you have students work? In oh, pairs oh individually. Or, yeah. Yes. Oh, excellent um, question and, and thank you for, for that um, question. Having uh, children be able to have in front of them actual images where they can circle um, explore, use magnifying glasses we bring into our, our work with young children in the context of the classroom. We um, give them um, their own um, hard copies of the Cropit tools where they can sort of narrow in and, and focus their lens um, themselves on particular aspects. Like, as we said that particular question, what, what is a clue in this picture that tells you where you think this is taking place? And they could actually themselves crop into maybe the pots or the stove in that particular um, context. So either individual um, images that children can look, use, and, and demonstrate their own ways of thinking with it, or in small groups, be able to work with peers is a wonderful uh, strategy um, in early learning classrooms. Terrific. And Sue Wise has just mentioned using iPads for marking up the digital images. This was a fabulous presentation, and I so much valuable information. Thank you so much to the presenters, and thank you to all of you for sharing your thoughts and asking your questions. Uh, just a couple of details before we end. Please give us your feedback. There's a link at the top of this slide, and it's just a three-question survey, and it will help us very much. Just take a minute or two. Um, once you complete the session, you will earn a certificate for one instructional hour, and you'll get an email within five business days about how to access this. Again, we thank all of you for joining us, and we thank the presenters. I'm going to end the recording now and end the meeting. Good night. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.